Um, I had a previous incarnation heading up DFID's finance division when DFID went through its major spending review thing. All of the information on the bilateral aid review, which resulted in a major shift of DFID's expenditure, was nothing to do with any changes in the budget process or the financial process. It was all done outside that, which sort of reinforces Professor Schick's points. So that's one point I wanted to make. Plus the fact that, you know, I think there's an indication when sometimes DFID puts pressure on developing country governments, it needs to look at its own financial systems as well. That's one point. Second point, just in terms of complexity, I'm almost always puzzled why in the UK we have a financial system in the, in the UK Treasury, we have different systems in every single government department, we have different si financial systems at local government, and the system works. I, I think we introduce a level of complexity in many of the countries in which we operate by almost enforcing or encouraging one system for the whole of government. And I think that introduces a level of complexity which perhaps is driven from the centre and perhaps takes away from a focus on outcomes and delivery. Thanks. Um, I'm going to hijack the mic uh, before passing on. Just also to, to add, as a uh, past in incarnation, along with some of the people here, I worked in the UK Treasury, and I wonder if, echoing what uh, Professor Schick has said, perhaps the answer, how does budgeting link to real world results, the answer is incrementally. Uh, so the, the practice of, of if we give you 5% more this year, line ministry, we will expect 100 more of this or 5,000 more of this is a more sensible and practical way of addressing the question of how public financial management or budgeting leads to results rather than trying to start from a baseline or start from a absolute figure of what, what one would get in return for uh, certain levels of expenditure. And now I, I should pass on. Thank you very much. I am Babram Subedi from Nepal. And uh, my question is to Professor uh, um, uh, uh, Alan Sikh. And uh, I do agree with you uh, absolutely that uh, control as well as the norms are necessary for any system and as well as process uh, to get results. Now, I wonder that uh, do we need uh, to grow sap mm, saplings uh, for the future results or uh, enjoy for the old days uh, uh, for our uh, sustainable future? That is my, uh, so I am confused. So I would like to ask you. Thank you. My name is Karin Mittal from the Swedish Institute of Public Administration. Um, I'm referring to Professor Schick's uh, presentation and, and feeling a bit uh, disillusioned perhaps about the links between PFM and development outcomes that we cannot see those. And I would like to refer to some research done by the Quality of Government Institute in, at G Gothenburg University where they have really compelling evidence that there is a clear link between development outcomes and some of the qualitative, qualitative aspects of institutions. And the key word here is impartiality uh, that really has an effect on how the trust of, of people and, and institutions. So, and what, what's meant by impartiality is, for example, merit-based recruitment, gender equality, uh, the, the level of taxes in the country, and I'm not saying that because I'm Swedish <laughs> and love paying taxes. <laughs> No, but, um, <laughs> but I think that it would be very interesting to hear your reflections on uh, how PFM systems can actually contribute to some of those more qualitative norms and traditions uh, and contribute to, to, to some of the, well, to, to impartiality, for example, if there is something that we could do focusing on those, on those aspects of PFM systems. We'll, we'll take one more on at this hand, Verena. Thank you very much. Um, I think one consideration to make when we think about linking PFM and development outcomes is how much money is actually available per capita to deliver certain services like education or health, and what the potential efficiency gains are from addressing PFM. So, how many, you know, what's the amount of inefficiencies and of leakages that are in the system? 
And just to mention, I've recently worked on three different countries, Nepal, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. And they each present a very different picture. In Nigeria, very clear cut. There's actually quite a lot of money, in particular in the southern states, and a lot of leakage and inefficiencies. So in principle, you could address, you know, being addressing PFM bottlenecks would be really worthwhile because there is money going into the system and not enough coming out. But of course, because of that, it's also a very difficult context because there's a reason why the money isn't reaching the service delivery. Then you look at Nepal, and yes, as we heard in the presentation earlier uh, this afternoon, there, is, there are efficiency gains that, that should be made. Um, but at the same time, we have to be conscious that Nepal is a very poor country. So if you make those efficiency gains, the actual per capita gain that you make for a certain service is also still limited. While at the same time, there may be other sources that could fund more of the service delivery, given, for example, that Nepal is highly resource uh, uh, remittent dependent. Then if you look at Ethiopia, has a very similar level of per capita incomes to Nepal, and has actually achieved a lot. So in some sense, um, maybe that is sort of the efficiency frontier in development that we could look at. So we need to think in terms of you know, what's the potential gains that can be made, and how likely is it that those gains will come about in this particular country, uh, and in a particular point in time uh, where they're at. And I think this has been nicely termed, and you know, this is building the ship while being at sea, or somebody recently called it building the plane while in flight which sounds really scary. Yeah. Okay, let me just, uh, I'll, 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 I'll stop there for now, we'll go through a round, and then I've got another three, at least three people lined up. So um, maybe we can just, yeah, there's a, there's a few comments, a few specific questions. We can just go around once and see if there are any reactions. Yeah, ju just just uh, the clarifications, what she mentioned about uh, the Nepal, the what she mentioned about the efficiency gain, uh, yes, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, our, our there is a system in place, but in our uh, part, or in Nepal also, there are some leakage. I, I, I do agree uh, with with uh, with her uh, saying that as our per capita is seven hundred twenty-one dollar, seven twenty-one per capita income. And uh, what what I mentioned during my presentation about the service delivery outcome, uh, infant mortality and uh, maternal mortality, that, that, that has decreased. How much we spend for to achieve that uh, outcome? Uh, the health sector expenditure that uh, doubled in 15 years from 33, it was 33 dollars 15 years before. Now it has gone to 60 per capita, six, 66 dollars per capita in health sector. In, uh, there are three, three components. One, increasing, we double the expenditure in the health sector. Uh, that helped to achieve the MDG. Uh, the second component was uh, the, we, reached to, to, to the remote area where that problem before before that uh, that that problem problem was very much you know uh, concentrated and uh, uh, the, the outreach I mean the out, out, outreach to remote area mm -hmm. we, we reached there and that uh, third factor was the modalities I mentioned earlier that uh, you know the, the community based community based morality uh, because of the innocence of the, our people knowledge of the people the mothers group that we created for uh, to to make aware to the citizen that that work and uh, i think uh, we we are uh, achieving the mdg uh, in, 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 in within within 2000 15 in the health sector. Similarly, we have some improvement in child mortality. The poverty <laughs> has reduced to 23 percent. Yeah, there, there are some outcomes. And even in uh, PFM sector, specifically in PFM sector, 
TSC single account uh, is in place in 75 district. Yeah, we, we have to, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, we have to look uh, for, for the downstream, mm -hmm. down, downstream efforts. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sheik, a few maybe short remarks. There were a couple of comments on your presentation and, uh, and a question for you. Yes. Um, first of all, <coughs> I, I, the, the idea that impartiality is linked to uh, uh, developing outcomes, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's generally linked to, in some studies to the overall quality of government. But this is not a, a PFM norm. It's what we call a meta norm that uh, envelops all of the society, not only the public sector. And so consequently, it shouldn't surprise us that, uh, that, that we have this outcome. And there are some countries uh, which actually have organized the public sector to optimize uh, 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 um, uh, impartiality, particularly some of the Northern European countries. Um, I must say, however, that I have assigned the book called The Quality of Government, uh, which is rises out of the study and uh, emphasizes impartiality. And the reaction of my students, these are graduate students, was not as enthusiastic. Uh, they insisted this cannot be the whole story. In other words, the impartiality movement has the same problem of every other movement, and that is it rests on only a single, uh, on a single argument. Uh, in a busy, complex world, the other things going on as, as, as well. Um, the the uh, gist of the other questions were, Rather about linking PFM resources, uh, 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 um, systems, to results, it's extremely hard to do, extremely hard to do, and that's why I tried to simplify it by, by simply offering two, two, two suggestions. One is you focus on services. We asked uh, by what is the demand for services, and the demand for services, uh, cross out the word civil society, is from a mother who. Uh, who, who wants a child to learn from the patient who's concerned that the drugs were not available, the physician was absent. Uh, uh, th this is the way society is developed. So s focusing on services uh, and on the incremental changes in services. Uh, to repeat what I said earlier, this is, the, this is the title of the conference, how you budget in the real world. And um, in the real world, these are the two things we focus on. Budget makers, I've asked them for 50 years what they focus on. They may not use quite the same two words that I'm using, but they focus on what services are being provided, and they focus on what to change from one time period to another period. That's incrementalism. It's possible to launch truly significant PFM reforms, pivoting on these two aspects. Uh, this is not uh, a theory of the third or fourth best that, that, that I would sell for. This is a way that governments can move forward. And notice, in talking about services and, 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 and marginal analysis, I'm not recommending any single system for doing it, or any particular PFM reform. I'm putting myself into the skull of budget makers in a real world, and this is the way to look at that world. Thanks. Any sh short answers from Nick and Mary? Just well, actually, just a couple of things. First, just on this, on, on the point about um, impartiality, and um, I'm um, actually I, I, I'm with Alan's students on this. That the um, I mean, yes, of course, right? You know, those correlations always hold good. The uh, but if we look at the sort of the detail of this, I and mean, if we look, for example, at Merrily Grindle's recent work in Latin America, where um, she highlights very clearly through a series of detailed case studies, then the uh, the the, uh, the uniquely useful power of patronage in terms of bringing competence in to, um, to ministries in a system where you're not sure that a, a detached arrangement, it might produce um, neutral or impartial staff, but not competent staff. And if you want to get something done in a hurry, then it turns out your cousin, as long as they're pretty well qualified, is actually a better way to get stuff done. Right? Yeah. So the question of... Um, Impartiality, yes, over enough years and over enough sort of cross-country studies, of course that's right at a very general level. But that doesn't therefore translate to say, therefore the model of 
examinations for civil servants. Therefore, the model of arm's length civil service commissions automatically should be imposed everywhere. So I, I agree with the broad point, but there's a risk always of going from those very, very general conclusions down to some absolute certainties about the, um, the arrangements in place. And, um, and just a quick further comment, the, um, the point that was raised, I think, Rayner on sort of efficiency frontier, et cetera, and, the sort of, and, and the, this whole discussion about the, um, the incremental gains, then um, I think part of the, uh, the puzzle, to my mind here, is how this gets translated <coughs> into something that's got some political resonance. And um, there was a, um, I mean, quite a discussion, quite a lot of dialogue in a, uh, a large West African country where oil and gas has um, recently started to produce revenues. And, the, um, and the, the only thing that like sort of stopped a, um, a sort of, you know, a rather sort of un, um, unhelpful um, use of incremental addition to, uh, to budgets from this was, um, was some dialogue that pointed out that in effect the additional revenue from oil and gas for the first three years was entirely going towards rewarding um, to increase in civil service pay. Right, you know. That then, I mean, when there was a clear message, had some political resonance, and the fear of that becoming known right, then led to some, um, some changes. So this question about the efficiency gains and what do we then do with the, um, any sort of you know, marginal addition, how to translate that into something that's got some political resonance, because to simply say it would be more efficient, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't resonate that much. Just, um, just Bryn's point about incremental gains, um, uh, this has implications for analytical capacities um, in both ministries of finance and in, in line ministries. Um, and these uh, capacities are often not, um, that is something that, that is often quite, quite low. Um, so uh, that's something um, that needs to be part of the, the conversation. Thanks. So we've, we only have a few minutes left. We may eat into the, the coffee break only, only slightly. So I will ask, I've got five people on the list for questions. I will literally ask them to not take more than half a minute each. So I've got the lady Okay, the very question. quickly. Uh, my name is Els Hinderdal. I am the procurement manager at the World Bank um, for the Africa region. So I have two points to make. Is, is it clear? Is it loud yep. enough? Yeah. So I think if you talk about how PFM connects with improved service delivery, you cannot really avoid talking about procurement. Yeah. And, and I, I hope that some of the speakers can come to that point because we want to make sure, we want to know whether the system delivers efficiently, efficiently delivers value for money or delivers at all. And I just wanted to give a very quick example. Um, so if the budget is approved in November, as is the case in many countries, and you only get the allocation to the line ministries in, let's say, January, and you have to spend your money by September, but you cannot start your procurement process before you have the money in allocated, that leaves you only a couple of months. So you cannot do efficient procurement, let alone competitive procurement, and maybe you cannot deliver at all. So that has, because most of the countries still have an annual uh, budget budgeting cycle. Uh, so I, that's my first point. The second point is related to uh, the granularity that Nick mentioned and, and the importance of learning. And I really think it's something that, that I relate to. Um, to me, it means that we need people who are inquisitive, uh, who really try to understand the root causes, but who also, as they develop solutions, think back about the local context in which they're going to apply the solution. And so we often analyze, but when we don't, but as we design the solution, we forget the local context, and to me that's key. Another example is um, in the, the World Bank was financing school building in South Sudan, uh, in far remote places, far away places, and there was an international competitive build, bidding process. A contractor was hired. Um, he, he brought equipment on site, to drill hole boreholes so that there would be water supply to the schools. But the contractor didn't know that half of the year South Sudan is flooded and that there is only 60 kilometers of paved road. So he, his bore machines, borehole machines, got stuck in the mud and he never managed to deliver on site the water to the school. So we now have schools that are not operational because there is no water. So just the point I want to demonstrate is that it's important that when you when you try to find solutions, that you really go to the granularity and you think about the constraints to delivering these results on the ground. Natasha in the back. Hi.
Hi, I'm Natasha from the World Bank in Mozambique. My question goes to Professor Alan Schick. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I agree with a lot of your findings, but how do you reconcile the importance of maintaining input controls when policy makers may be interested in using the budget to demonstrate results and to um, rally behind an agenda and to deliver key messages particularly in an era of fiscal transparency when they're being encouraged to open up their books. So if you're being encouraged to open up books of just line items, is that exciting? And what are the implications of this? Thanks. Thanks, Renaud. Well, Bank. Um, so I, I fully understand the the points made about the difficulty of of making that <laughs> that correlation or that causation apparent between you know pfm improvements and, and development outcomes and we struggle with that every day but let me put to the panel the the counterfactual to what extent is the panel aware of situations where there is atrocious pfm and very good development outcomes i'm not aware of any country where that's in that situation even looking at the dynamic picture countries where there's deteriorating pfm and improving development outcomes i haven't encountered either now what does that tell us about that about, about, about that link between pfm and and development outcomes uh, here at the back sorry I'm uh, John Burton with KPMG. Uh, I think this session is actually at the nub of the problem, really. What does PFM deliver? And as somebody who's not really a PFM specialist and more of a general development economist, I must say I'm quite shocked coming into this session and finding how little kind of confidence and promotion of the PFM agenda uh, that I've picked up from you all because uh, you know, if you guys don't believe in PFM and say it delivers development outcomes, then no one else is going to believe it. So <laughs> if you haven't got the evidence, uh, go and find it, guys, because you need it to, to promote your agenda. <laughs> uh, Professor Schick, I was interested in your analysis, but are you not really just saying because developed countries developed without this stuff, everyone else has to do it without the modern technology? I mean, if we looked at telecoms, we wouldn't say, well, do it the way we did it 50 <laughs> years ago. You'd say do it the way we're doing it now. So isn't there anything in this whole agenda for developing countries that's good, even if developed countries didn't use it? That was one point. And the second point was about incrementalism. The problem with incrementalism is you move, you move pretty slowly because your incremental resources are rather small. Now, looking at the MDGs, countries have to make huge changes, you know, doubling the health budget or increasing the health budget by three or four fold. So you have to look at your whole resource and make big shifts, not just incremental shifts. So I personally would, would worry that if we went down the incremental route, we just would move too slowly in reallocating resources to where they are most needed. Thank you. Philip. First of all, Marco asked me to point out to Renault that my stock answer to your question would be Germany because Marco thinks that Germany's PFM system is atrocious <laughs> and most of, all most of us think that uh, development outcomes there are pretty okay. Um, I have two questions for, for the panel. The first one, I think, predominantly for Mr. Acharya and for Nick. I noted that in Nepal, uh, the, the World Bank front-end counterparts facing people like Mr. Acharya and Babu Amji in the Ministry of Finance are all Nepalis who have worked in the country for 30, 40 years and who in some instances had very distinguished civil service careers before they started working for the bank. And a lot of the bilateral donors are doing the usual churn of people who come in for two years and then move on somewhere else, probably applying the same solutions wherever they go. And I'm just curious, Nick, what you what you think this might imply for the for the for the sort of 700 people <laughs> cadre? And I'm wondering, um, Mr. Acharya, whether you think that you're actually being better served by those people, or whether you're being better served by the international experts who have seen 50 countries and can tell you exactly how our systems work in a more sort of detailed, technical way. And then the, the this maybe slightly bigger question is that 
So following on Alan's presentation, it made me think that maybe there is an issue here if you if you apply what maybe some people would call a political economy approach and you say that what people most care about is what's right in front of them. And so for people in the Ministry of Finance, what's right in front of them, what they take home when they leave their job at the end of the day is, did I control expenditures? Did the money go to places? These relatively simple things. If you, if you look at international agencies, then of course if you work for an aid and development organization, then you care about getting money out the door, hitting the 0 0.7 target, and yes, because we're all very good and kind people, we also care about achieving development results. I'm, if, you, if you look at, and I think it's, it's an interesting point that you just made, that I don't think that anyone is going to a Ministry of Health and says to them, not only do we ask you to improve health outcomes, we're also asking you to achieve macroeconomic stability, improve education, and nudge people to become kinder, nicer people. So I'm not quite sure I would necessarily buy that just because PFM systems are kind of connected to everything else, that they also need to immediately, right in front of your face, be able to show that they are improving everything under the sun and not just what, what people really care about in their day jobs. But more generally, if you, if you think about the incentive issue, who is it in a government whose incentive it would be for those governments to improve development results. I understand how donors are incentivized to care about development results as measured by NDGs in developing countries. Who in the government should care about these things? And I literally don't mean that as a rhetorical question. I mean it as a genuine question, because those should probably be the people we should be talking to about these sorts of questions who then might delegate to the PFM people what they know how to do best. Thanks. So yeah, we've got quite a, quite a rich set of uh, comments and questions there. Uh, let's go back to the panel, maybe do it the other way around and start with, uh, start with Mary, maybe pick and choose a couple of the things that caught your attention. And if you could, then I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, try and also draw out you know, maybe one or two reflections on this broader debate and in, in a way what you, what you take home for, for your Monday morning uh, uh, personal reforms, let's put it that way. <laughs> so Mary, I'll get Mary, Nick, and then Alan and Mr. Bachelet. Um, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go first. Um, I think um, Philip has, has hit the nub um, uh, of the, the, the issue um, because I think I don't think there is any one particular uh, person who, or, or even a, a small group of people who really ha is looking at the, the whole picture uh, realistically. Um, I think you have uh, a sort of plurality of, of, of interests. Um, but that's my question as well. I mean, not just who's looking at the, the, the whole picture, but actually, you know, where is, you know, if I'm a civil servant and I have my day to day demands. Am I really thinking, even in, in a health sector, am I really, really thinking about, um, you know, uh, what services are being provided and how efficiently they are? I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, broadly, maybe. But day-to-day, -day, it is actually, it's very difficult to be looking at that. And if you're talking then at the highest level, um, you know, that is a very, very difficult question. So, but it hits at the nub uh, of, of what we're talking about here. Um, um, I think the other issue I wanted to to raise was just John's point about incrementalism, uh, meaning that you move slowly. I would argue that moving slowly forward is better than moving fast backwards. So, you know, what we're talking about is 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 PFM reform is is very difficult, and you do only see change very slowly over time. Isn't it better that, that, that we're focusing uh, more on, on possibly what we can do and actually recognizing that we're, we can only make very small change? And, and, and donor agencies find this very difficult to, to acknowledge. So I think that would be a, a huge <coughs> step forward. Um, I think I'll, I'll pass along, but I think. Thanks. Thanks. Um, well, just to cherry pick a few of the 
easier ones. I mean, I, I think, um, Elsie, your, your, your point about procurement, I mean, point very well taken. I should have made reference to that. I think one of the uh, issues in here, and you and I have discussed this, is our dire problem in procurement in terms of any sort of comparative data. And uh, I mean, we've got this problem in every area, but I mean, it's you know, in procurement, it's no, um, it's no better than in um, than in others. So um, we uh, we don't have a um, a good set of sort of you know, functional or um, or behavioural data in terms of procurement. So we're very much sort of you know still running on a set of very reasonable, but um, ultimately they are um, they are hunches. Um, so it's it's hard for us to um to learn in that um, in that area without something that we can test the um, but i mean certainly the um I mean, the overall point that's being made is that um if you can improve if you can improve the efficiency and the quality of government procurement even if you couldn't do anything else then my god you've done a lot right yeah so um abs abs absolutely i mean that um, that point is very well taken on um, Renault, on on your issue about like sort of you know where do we see anything sort of useful happening into a good positive happening in terms of um, development where um, PFM systems are bad or deteriorating. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any, I don't think anybody's challenging the broad connection. It's a bit like the, uh, the point that was made earlier about um, impartiality. I mean, at some meta level, yes, of course. I mean, it's, you know, I don't, it's, it's, it's connected with, um, with good things, but that isn't really our problem, right? You know, our, our problem is so what? Right, you know what, it, and so you know what the it's, it's the sort of characterization of what cor what sort of counts as good, and to my mind, just very very crudely, I mean, I think that we have to um, we have to make a distinction between um, the sort of the tactics and the system. So if we sort of notionally decide those two, you know, divide those two things, one is like what's the mechanics, what's the plumbing of this thing, and then the other is what's the tactics of um, of intervention or involvement, and um, in both of those. I don't see how we can avoid, however skeptical we are about indicators and comparative data, and it's not getting down to the nuances and it's not doing discourse analysis, but I don't see how we can avoid having some hunches about this we, we believe represents some way of capturing a model which we're offering as a normative proposition, but we're open to testing it. Right, yeah. And this is one of the issues for um, for PIFA, which I mean has certainly opened up the territory enormously. Right, you know. But the question is, how do we then make it a more sort of constant debate about? So yes, you're doing better on the PIFA scores, but what do the PIFA scores mean? Mm -hmm. What do we know about any of these PIFA scores? What is there a risk that something like PIFA, because of the complexity of the situation, it becomes the sort of Nicene Creed? So you can't really challenge whether or not the creed is right. All you can do is say, to what degree are you adhering to the, uh, to the creed? So how do we, now that we've made very significant advances in that way, how do we now nuance this and how do we make this a more reflexive process of constant learning? And those two stages, are we managing to make a difference in this model, that is this notional model that we've developed and what's our evidence base let's really keep challenging ourselves about the evidence base that links that model through to any uh, through to any development outcomes and the uh, then oh then then the point well the easier question philip that you put on the uh, the table about sort of you know local knowledge versus sort of in international knowledge that that actually is a very live issue for us i mean we uh, we we run the risk I think within the uh, within the bank of overvaluing global knowledge and beginning to undervalue local knowledge, and it's it, it is real. It's it's a real concern. What the right way of approaching that is, I, I'm really really not sure. Right, you know, because the um, we've certainly been criticised quite a lot, and this relates to a point that was made this morning for um, for taking sort of you know retired local staff, putting them onto a better salary scale, and then offering them back as experts. And then the question is, well, you know. What exactly, you know, what's being brought to the picture that's new in all this, right? You know, so we have to find some way of not simply repackaging the same stuff, but equally without some sort of mediation of local knowledge through which we're offering any sort of broader insights, then it's just free floating, uh, disconnected advice and it gets flooded out when the rainy season comes. <laughs> so, yeah, how to, uh, how to make the right balance, I'm not sure. Thanks. Uh, Professor Schick? Well, uh, uh, the, the first question actually opened the door to a reform that I do approve. <laughs> and uh, the question, if I recall, uh, I spoke about the uncertainty where you're living hand to mouth with monthly quotas or allocations. 
And I can, uh, my only observation is that that is one of the greatest impediments uh, to development, the uncertainty, uh, the uh, um, inability to think ahead, to actually think about any results other than making it through to the next uh, a quota or allotment from the government. It's kind of funny that we would tell the same country, uh, think ahead four to five years in a medium term framework, but don't think ahead more than 30 days in terms of how you're actually uh, going about your work. Uh, so this is probably um, uh, a critical reform. But let me generalize. Almost every PFM reform that we talk about deals with what uh, the World Bank now calls upstream, what happens at the center of government. Um, an investment in reform in, uh, in, uh, in downstream, that is uh, executing the budget and implementing the various activities, that actually what a service-related strategy that I re recommended uh, earlier is. Uh, one question I asked about, well, maybe uh, budget reforms or PFM reforms don't create good outcomes, but we certainly know that really very bad PFM systems Degrade, uh, degrade development. That's true, but it does require they ask, what do you mean by, uh, by really bad PFM systems? And they drive you back to basic reforms. A budget which doesn't, a budget which has uh, spending entries don't, which don't correspond to actual expenditure, uh, a uh, financial system where there are a huge number of pockets of money and people have their own pockets and that, that breeds a lot of corruption, et cetera. So uh, worrying about getting simply bringing up a PF system so that it has basic capacity will itself uh, propel uh, development. Uh, the question about does, doesn't incrementalism mean uh, um, going slowly and that that may apply for developed countries but can't apply to developing countries. I first heard that objection in 1957 when I was a student in Professor Lindblom's class. That was a very long time ago. He was the godfather of incrementalism and, uh, and uh, uh, rotten p tomatoes being thrown at him for condemning developing countries to, uh, to uh, uh, no last place status. Uh, I don't recall what his response is, but I think China's given the best response. Let's assume that China has grown since the early 1980s at 8% uh, a year. Now, if you were budgeting, 8% would be an increment. Okay. Chinese growth since 1980, compounded 2013, means that real GDP in China is over 30 times greater than it was in, uh, in 1980. So the moral of the story, we've heard, heard that answer before, is incrementalism, you can go very far, but you can't skip steps in doing so. Thank you. Can I take yeah. another one second? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Just, just, very, very briefly. Actually, Al Alan's um, comment on the um, on the importance of the sort of downstream issues in, um, in PFM has just um, reminded me again of this sort of challenge that we've got in terms of collective action about learning. We, um, we recently um, assembled every possible data set that we could pull together looking at um, public management arrangements in the broadest possible sense and service delivery outputs and outcomes within the Middle East and North Africa. So a massive exercise, you know, millions of spreadsheets, Deloitte were working with us, a big data exercise. The summary conclusion of this was that we could learn nothing by adding them up because every one of these was so idiosyncratic, it had been done for such a specific purpose, the donor involved, typically these were donor finance, the donors involved had driven it for their own immediate short-term concerns, and you simply couldn't gain anything by mushing them all together. There was no way of extrapolating from that. Right? You know, a really, to my mind, I mean, a really poignant example of the collective action problem that we've got in terms of how we learn about this stuff and the sort of collective action problem that we've got to overcome if we're, that we're genuinely going to have something more to offer in terms of what is it about public finance management systems specifically or public management in general and what is it beyond the sort of the hunches and the reasonable beliefs that we've all got in terms of how that then connects to, um, to outcomes. Just uh, very briefly, uh, I, I will touch on two points. The first one again related to service delivery. 
Uh, that means, uh, first of all, we, we don't have the basics, you know. We don't have uh, the is school building. We don't have the health post. We don't have the, the basic, basic things. First, we have to construct, we have to build, we have to uh, make, make, make the place to study, you know. Then we, we can think of uh, quality. Yeah. First, think the basic for, for us. First, for developed country that, uh, that may go together, mm -hmm. but for us, first, create the basics, infrastructure, then, then we can think of the um, quality. And uh, whether the teacher is uh, working or not, then, you know, all, all the, that kind of things um, uh, will, will follow. Mm -hmm. Then the, the second, second point that, that is, which, which, which is very pertinent, uh, Philip, to the issue, and uh, <laughs> Nick, he, he just uh, uh, told that balancing the local versus uh, international knowledge, mm. that, that, that will uh, be the solution, as you mentioned. But from our experience, from our experience, I, I'll uh, bluntly say that uh, the people who were in, in the government are the local people, local people, <laughs> local experts, uh, they went to the bank or the other donor donor agency. They are performing very well, very well. And then, come if you compare compare the two 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 people, one from external, <coughs> external, one from the local, and uh, the persons who went from the government and are from the uh, academic institutions to the bank and in other, other donor, don, donors and agency office, they, their performance is better. I, I must say uh, bluntly that their performance is better than the consultant <coughs> or expert. They, are, they just come from for two years, one year, three years. Sorry, sorry, I, I, have, <laughs> to, I have to you know, say very bluntly. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for being so patient. I just realized that I forgot a question that came online. I'm not going to get people to, uh, to answer it now. And it was for Nick, but I'll show it to you over the coffee break. And uh, maybe you can send an email to this person or something. There's a message also for you all. <laughs> it sounds like it was ominous. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a message for you all. Please, can you complete and fill in the Cape Conference feedback forms? They are in the. Uh, in the packs that you have in your chairs, if not, there's a few more in, in the, on the table here at the, at the back of uh, here by the entrance. Uh, how many, how long the coffee break? 15, 20 minutes? 20 minutes coffee break, back in the room for the final closing session at 20 to 5. Please join me in thanking all of the panelists for their interventions.